This is really an extraordinary day and we're off to a great start. And I wanna welcome our uh, live stream audience, uh, wherever you may be and whatever you may be doing. Um, we're glad you're here, wherever you are. Uh, working at a place uh, like National Geographic, there have been many amazing peoples walking the halls here over the years and it is not uncommon to hear them described as pioneers and innovators and trailblazers. And yet none of these monikers seem to go far enough in describing the accomplishments and influence of David Dubillet and Jimmy Chen. They are truly two of the most extraordinarily talented folks to ever walk through these doors. Both of them journey to the ends of the earth, showing us places in ways we never thought possible. Jimmy has just come back from an expedition where he and an all-star team climbed mountains in Antarctica's Queen Maud land. And now he faces his latest and greatest challenge, that of interviewer. <laughs> so a guy who spends much of his time working at the top of the world is here to interview one who can most often be found working 20,000 leagues beneath it. Now, many of you probably had your first experience with life beneath the water through the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. It was a great show. I had a slightly different upbringing, and I count as a major influence the adventures of Mike Nelson. Nelson, if you don't know, was an ex-Navy frogman played by Lloyd Bridges on the 1960s action-adventure TV show, Sea Hunt. He was a Rolex-wearing freelance photographer, a crime-solving skin diver, <laughs> outmaneuvering bad guys and fighting giant clams. He once battled murderous pirates while working as an underwater photographer for a famous bathing suit designer. Nelson once helped police solve a murder just by looking at the color balance of the suspect's underwater photographs. Rough weather, sharks, bullets, and enemy frogmen, that is how I imagine the working world of David Dubillet, defying gravity <laughs> without the enemy frogmen, armed only with an underwater camera and a 36 exposure roll of Kodachrome and a Rolex too. <laughs> a Dubillet photograph simply overwhelms. At times, you find yourself holding your breath. Every single image born from an elaborate and graceful ballet between water, light, and time. David is a street photographer at work in an alien world of mystery, an underwater Henri Cartier-Bresson, if you will, combining elements of the decisive moment with Irving Penn's mastery of light and composition. He is an advocate for preservation and conservation in the great tradition of photographers, Ansel Adams and William Henry Jackson. But aside from the parallels and the comparisons, the real measure is that of David Dubillet's influence because it extends well beyond the water's edge, beyond the photography of the natural world, beyond the pages of National Geographic. David has taken underwater photography somewhere it's never been, artistically, journalistically, geographically, in a way that had never been seen, and with that, influenced and inspired an entire generation of photographers. Please welcome. David Dubillet and Jimmy Chen. I'm gonna let you play. I don't know. Am I here? You're there. I don't remember. I can't remember either. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, we were just comparing notes on the um, effects on our short-term memory from uh, spending too much time in oxygen-deprived environments. Huh? <laughs> and we decided that we probably weren't a great pairing because we might both forget what we're talking about, but we, we can't are, even remember where we're supposed to sit. Where are you? I hope this is right. Um, so I am gonna try to channel my Terry Gross and get into this, but you know, one of the first, uh, times I saw David's work was actually, uh, you know, I was talking to the late Galen Rao, who was a, a big influence of mine, and I asked him, you know, what photographers I should, you know, follow and look at. And he had mentioned David's name, and uh, one of my favorite books is Water, Light, Time. Sure. And uh, so today, you know, I. I think we all just want to know a bit more about the man behind the images and 
I want to get a sense of, you know, the things that shaped you and kind of follow the arc of, of your career. So uh, if we want to maybe start at the beginning, I mean, well, you've had 70, 70 articles? 70, 71, 77, somewhere around there, stories that we've worked on, Jennifer and I have been working on at least, uh, we've just uh, finished working on a story in the Philippines where, and the Sargasso Sea with uh, David Lishwager. So we're somewhere around that number. It, it seems like an enormous number, but <laughs> it also seems like it began all this business yesterday. Right. And it's, uh, that's how time flies when you're underwater. It's the most precious thing. Well, how, w when did you first, you know, how long have you been diving? I, I started diving when I was eight. And I went to a summer camp. You know, if you, if you grow up in New York City, you're sent to these summer camps in, in the summer in the Adirondacks. It's, it's, you know, for most kids, it's great. But for me, it was like a sentence. <laughs> and they, they made me climb mountains, Jimmy. <laughs> and, and, Sounds and, awful. And I had asthma. So I, I wheezed my way up to the top of a couple peaks, and that was it. And then they, the evil camp counselor sent me down to the lake said, clean out the branches under a dock. There was an enormous water spider there that they wanted me to see so I'd be frightened. They would be full of glee, the 14-year-old monster counselors. And uh, <laughs> gave me a rubber, ma red, a blue French mask, and I molded it to my face, and I put my head underwater. And everything, everything changed, everything. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, this world where I was a classic underachiever disappeared. The asthma disappeared, and fish, you know, fish appeared before my eyes with shafts of green light. I still remember it. It's amazing. Well, I, I'm always always curious about, you know, your people's upbringings yeah. and family. Can you tell me a little bit about? Well, were they an well, influence on you being in the, in the in the water? Or? Not really, and yes and no. I mean, it's a good answers. I grew up in New York City, which is, as you all know, is, is a hotbed of underwater photography. <laughs> and uh, I was a Jewish kid, and, uh, you know, theoretically, as an underwater photographer, I should be about six feet two from California, blonde hair, <laughs> and named Chad, but I wasn't. <laughs> That, that was my dad before. Can we go back to my, my picture of my dad for a second? Yeah. Uh, he was an enormous, he was a professor of surgery at NYU, an enormous influence in my life. And he gave me, I guess, the most precious thing we can all get, which is all of us share that. I think it's the most, most, one of the most important attributes of, of humanity, which is intense, unyielding curiosity. And he wanted me to be a doctor, but I flunked the uh, eighth grade math. And he was furious, he was a mad Canadian, and he went to the, he went to the teacher, a guy named Gus Trowbridge, and he said, in, in his mad Canadian voice, he said, all the little bastard does is want to swim underwater and take pictures, what the hell should I do? <laughs> And Gus said in his- Very supportive. Yeah, and in, in, yeah. <laughs> in his infinite wisdom, he said, let him. I was the National Geographic photographer when I was 10, you know. I was reading under, you know, reading about Louis Martin, who was my absolute hero standing next to Cousteau. This is my bar mitzvah picture. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. And how old are you? I'm, I'm 13. I've okay. just been bar mitzvahed yeah, yeah. like yeah. hours before. I am now a man. Now, mostly in bar mitzvahs, you get these presents, like you get expensive fountain pens and you get, the, you get bonds, you know, savings bonds. You know, here, here's a $25 savings bond. In 50 years, it'll be worth $50, kid. Stick around. I want it underwater stuff. I got this wetsuit that's beautifully fitted, as you can see. <laughs> An underwater watch that leaked a spear gun. All underwater photographers of my age and generation began shooting fish. And later on, we changed from gun to camera. And I got this terrific snorkel, too. These are pictures I made when I was 17 right. with a camera called a Roller Marine, which is a Roller Flex and a fabulous housing made in Germany. And, uh, you could see through it and focus, but it, it made pictures that are either the size of 
grapefruits or baseballs or something that's square that fits in. And it was a terrific battle. It was a terrific battle to make a picture underwater that you, you saw these things underwater through your mask and you couldn't get at them. And then everything changed in 1969, 1970, when Bates Little Hales, who was a National Geographic photographer and my hero, reached into his pocket and pulled out a little Kodachrome. Uh, hopefully it wasn't the original, but knowing Bates it was. And he gave it to me in, in a conference in uh, San Francisco. And it was made with a housing that he developed called an Ocean Eye housing. Big bubble, a plexiglass bubble, uh, corrected the, the uh, underwater uh, magnification. And all of a sudden we had, we had a system that could make pictures uh, that we saw underwater. And every single photographer and every single underwater picture in the world has been derived from that camera system and from Bates, invented here at National Geographic, because we stand on each other's shoulders. This is the most important thing about Geographic. And Bates gave me this housing, and I ran with it as far as I could as fast as I could throughout the world's oceans to try and make the images that I saw in a world that we're just beginning to discover. All right, so you said you were a National Geographic photographer by 10. Did yeah, you I was 10 years. I well, mean, I knew I, in my head that I, know, I was, but, but they didn't know, but, <laughs> but I knew. But, but was it just, you, you knew you were gonna yeah. make it there. Yeah. Was there any challenges or doubts along uh, that actually, path? I mean, when, from then to, w w how old were you when you shot your first assignment? 11, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I guess I was 22, 23. I, okay, so I, I, what's I, that I look terrible, like between 10 and... Yeah, it was terrible doubts. There was, this is what I wanted to go to, but uh, I couldn't get it. What, what did that look like? I mean, how, how did you make that Well, happen? what happened was that I was invited to shoot a, uh, to go on an expedition that looked after these creatures called garden eels in the Red Sea. And garden eels are about as, as round as your thumb, and they're about a meter long. And if you get right next to them, if you come up, you see fields of them. That's what they call a garden of eels. And if you come up to them, they disappear into the sand like a mirage. And here I had this ocean eye camera. I went to photogrammetry, which made the cameras. Photogrammetry is a company up in Rockville, and I had them make a camera with a 40-foot long extension cord and a push button, because I could place it next to the eel, run the, run the cord under the sand, hide in a blind that we made, and make the picture. And uh, Jim Stanfield was the photographer on this Garden Eel expedi expedition. Dr. Eugenie Clark, who became a fast friend, uh, and we did 10, uh, 10 stories with her. And Jennifer Hayes, my partner and my wife, was her last, uh, last graduate student. So life was very connected. But we, we made this picture one morning, and it, it was the first geographic picture that I made. And, and Jim was very kind. And like this whole idea of, of helping people out and standing on each other's shoulders, that's where it all, that's where it all connected from. But were you nervous on the first assignment? Nervous, throwing up nervous. Okay, <laughs> just making you sure know, every, that everybody's having Every morning we unroll the stupid housing and then sometimes it actually caught fire inside because the <laughs> connections that I was soldering myself, I mean, I'm, I'm, don't let me anywhere near like rocket ships or automobiles because I'll ruin them. Um, but it worked. And when I, when we, and he never saw the pictures. This was the amazing thing about uh, about uh, shooting with the thing called film. <laughs> film. 550 rolls of pictures going down the Red Sea, and I didn't see a single picture that I made for almost four months. It was big casino then, and it was crazy, but, yeah. but now we can see what we're shooting, so it, it makes all the difference in the world. All right. But what about, how about the drive? I mean, what was the, the motivation from the beginning? Has it evolved or was it the same? Did you know what you wanted to do? I think the drive was I saw pictures. 
I went underwater, and when, when you're underwater, the idea of drive and, and concept and what you want to do is this all-inspiring and all-forceful way of saying, this is this entire new world, and it is full of imagery. It, it is full of, and to get there, to drive and go and get there, was the force behind making story after story. Uh, and looking at imagery after imagery and, and trying to get this moment and <coughs> bathing in this light that's underwater all the time. And, but there's so much self-doubt, you know. Can I do this? Will it come out? Uh, are you making the right decision in the right place in an, in an ocean where you have moments, an hour, two hours, 15 minutes sometimes a day, are you going to be in the right place at the right time, or are you just sort of swimming around blowing it? And uh, it still happens all the time. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous self-doubt. And with, with digital, your self-doubt can be uh, uh, really uh, nailed down specifically. I really, you know, every night, Jennifer and I look at these things, and, and she looks at me, and I look at her, and then she looks at me and said, you really blown this. <laughs> And sometimes you have a second chance, and that's, that's the beauty of digital. And sometimes what you think is blowing a story is actually a pretty good picture. Right. And that, you know, that depends on the, on the picture editor. Kathy Moran has been my picture editor for, for a million decades. She has seen <laughs> probably, well. she, Kathy has probably seen 150 billion underexposed <laughs> images that I've made in my life in the film era. And it feeds back. And between us, we, we have a, this kind of a tough agreement of how imagery and everything else goes. But it's always that self-doubt that lingers. But was there any doubt that you were on the right path when you were, let's say, 16, 17, 20? No, that this, was not. This is what I really wanted to do. You know, I um, actually, truthfully, I really wanted to be a certified public accountant, but my parents <laughs> kept pulling me back in. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is what I wanted to do. I couldn't yeah. think of anything. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be a Navy pilot, but I would have crashed into the back of the aircraft carrier <laughs> in my first try. But I mean, it's all of these things. But. It's addictive, underwater, and it's, it's, I guess it's one of the, the problems of this business is that all of us have an addiction to imagery, not to travel, not to adventure, not to Mr. Geographic, Mrs. Geographic, but this addiction to the image. And this is what I love. Let's talk about these turtles for a second. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's right. Let's, um, let's hear about the turtles. So, What do you call this shot? Well, this is sex. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Uh, Jennifer, we get, we get a call. It's two loggerhead turtles mating uh, in the National Marine Sanctuary in, in, uh, uh, in the Florida Keys. And loggerhead turtles mating are really, really rare. There's a lot of green turtle mating pictures, but loggerheads, not so much. And they continue to mate normally you're swimming along and then somebody says, there's a loggerhead turtle mating, or you see one over there, and you, or, or any turtle mating, and you swim up to them with a camera. And it's, it's like busting into a motel with a speed graphic and saying, just keep doing what you're doing, you know? <laughs> and, but the turtles kept going at it. And I have a big, I'm having a big underwater housing, I have my underwater housing, two strobes, big dome, and I'm holding this, and out of the corner of my eye, I see another turtle swimming over to these two mating turtles. And it's a very handsome, young-looking turtle with dark <laughs> eyes. Now, now, now turtles uh, are the Mr. Magoos of the ocean. They, they, uh, they can't see anything because they eat jellyfish. The jellyfish sting their eyes. They have terrible cataracts. But the turtle comes up to me, and he goes, hey, hey. Me? You? You and me? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I say, and I can't do anything, so I have to like, t 
talk to him in turtle language, bubbling through the regular. So then I'd say, not me, you fool, go over there. <laughs> and then he went over. <laughs> and now you have the only loggerhead menage a trois shot <laughs> ever taken. Yes. It, got, it got a little bit worse. Another loggerhead came in, and oh, then wow. they rolled around the floor, uh, rolled around the the sandy sea floor with a turtle head here and a turtle. I went up to the surface and started again. <laughs> okay. Well, that being said, I, I don't know how to follow that up, but, um, you know, I, I talked to a lot of other photographers, um, some of your protégés, and, you know, everybody says the same thing, how they were inspired very early on in their career um, by the work that you did, and even you know, apprenticed under you, uh, Brian Scarry, Paul Nicklin. I asked both um, if they had any questions for you. Um, and you know, they always talked about, they both talked about how your work is, the, you know, represents the confluence of art, science, and conservation. And, you know, what part of that is, you know, the most important to you? And what's your kind of take on that? Idea? Well. It's constantly driven into us by editors, by the editor, uh, that we are storytellers at the Geographic. We are journalists. And uh, the story is everything. Uh, you have to tell the story. You have to tell it accurately. You have to illuminate, because that's the, the power of photography, the ability to illuminate, to humiliate, uh, to celebrate and to convince the unconvinced. And um, the thing is that with a great picture story, what I've always been after is to make an image that transcends the needs of the story, that has a piece of art or a piece of poetry. I've always thought that the difference between uh, film and, and photography is the difference between uh, prose and poetry. We have to basically allude to everything else in a moment, in a tiny, small moment of light and time and uh, gesture, as Jay Maisel would say, action. And it's, it's, that has to be distilled into an image. And that's what drives the success of this magazine. Uh, it's not, you know, every person, every human on this planet has a, has a camera right now. And it's a terribly competitive world. And to succeed in it, you can't lift weights or, or run, but for, for you, you can, you have to do this because you have to be in this incredible shape. But for a lot of others, it's, it's also that, but it's also the fact that we have to dream other dreams. Not better, but different. That makes, uh, I wanted to follow that up also with a question um, from Paul. I said, Paul, what, what would you ask uh, David? He's like, ask him about his gills. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so is, you know, Paul was talking to me about how, you know, you can stay underwater longer than anybody. You can make a tank last for two hours. Um, I mean, is the technical aspect of diving, is that part of, of what draws you to this? Is it the adventure of that, or is it purely just capturing imagery? It's, it's pictures. I, you know, I can stand her water, and, and Jennifer does the same, but she does it even longer. And we, we finally figured it out. We make a tank last, because when you're taking a picture, you're holding your breath. It may be as simple as that, or we're more efficient, you know, as, as a child had asthma, so every, every breath counted and every piece of oxygen counted yeah. that was taken into my lungs, so I guess I used it more efficiently, which means that I keep going to sleep all the time, but that's... <laughs> right, but didn't you just come, how long were you underwater in Cuba on this last trip, just to give well, people an idea? Well, we, 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 uh, we discovered that being underwater for a really long time, we once spent nine hours underwater in Cuba in a very shallow reef, and it made a lot of very strange changes in, in my body. It, it, uh, okay. for, for, 
I mean, I could be specific about it. <laughs> that was what Jennifer was complaining about? Yeah, it, was, it okay. didn't do much. Okay. Well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll pass on that one. Okay. Um, All right. Okay, so <laughs> I've had a, a, a few conversations about the tyranny of kind of passion. Uh, I was talking to a good friend, John Krakauer, about how you don't, you know, you might not find your passion, passion finds you. And, you know, John would talk about how, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, climbing found us. And because you make a lot of sacrifices, you spend most of your time trying to stay warm, uh, you leave your family for months at a time. I'm wondering if you feel like uh, you haven't made any sacrifices for this or any regrets? There's terrible sacrifices and terrible regrets. Uh, this pressure of the next picture, the assignment, uh, uh, the deadlines, uh, and the fact that getting there and, and working and shooting, uh, going on and on, this pressure of the next image, it destroys any semblance of um, a personal life in many ways. Jennifer and I were just shooting in, in uh, uh, we were shooting in the Philippines. And it was our anniversary, and I, mean, I blew right through it. We were going underwater on our anniversary. That's not a good thing. And if anybody would take a piece of advice in this totally addictive world that we are living in as photographers, is to don't do it, stop, be normal. <laughs> Try to do that, back away. Oh, here's what I have to, used to shoot with, uh, with in the days of film. 36 exposures, you shoot 10 cameras, you shoot 360 pictures. <laughs> Imagine that. Wait. I'm, I'm not gonna die, you know, I'm not gonna die eaten by a great marine creature. I'm gonna die checking into a, and it into an airport with the excess bags. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, toughest assignments? Or let's say most emotional assignment. The most emotional assignment, there was some, uh, well, I guess the most emotional part of an assignment was I was uh, working in a little town called Futo a uh, fishing village uh, 60 miles south of Tokyo, doing a story on uh, Izo Kayo Kogan and, and uh, Marine Park there. And they closed the village for us one day, or they just closed the harbor. And they said, we're, we're, some dolphins are coming in. Futo was a dolphin hunting village, and they would drive the dolphins into the harbor, seal the harbor's uh, mouth, and the dolphins wouldn't jump across a tiny little barrier. They drove 1,200 uh, spotted dolphins, Japanese spotted dolphins in and began to slaughter them. Uh, the head of the uh, fishing cooperative, head man of the village said, I could photograph. He said, this may not happen again to my friend Koji. And I went down there and he let me photograph. The dolphin catchers were not happy. And, uh, but I stood on the, on the K, on the cement K, and they would round up the dolphins, push them into a net, and begin to cut their carotid artery. Uh, and they'd bleed to death. And as they bleed to, bled to death, they would scream, a uh, high-pitched scream, which would go through the water, into the K, up through my feet. And I'm photographing. <coughs> that was a, a, an exceptionally extraordinary emotional thing. Diving on the, on the Arizona and, and Pearl Harbor, we're very lucky that we can work with our friends Brett Seymour at the National Park uh, Service divers, who are the only people on the Arizona. And we would sit there and begin to swim along the hull. It's very dirty water in Pearl Harbor, but you can reach out and touch the hull of the ship where 1,177 souls are uh, still in there. And that, that's pretty tough to think about. So you, you can get emotional about that. The sea washes away a lot of things. Our, our time is so brief there that you don't have a chance to really think or feel you have to shoot and collect your emotions later. But there, in those two instances, it was uh, emotional. 
dangerous, uh, uh, the most dangerous story we ever did was diving in the Okavanga Delta. And Franz and Chris said, you have got to suggest this story. The water gets very clear for a month. And the delta, the, the Okavanga River floods through the delta, and, and to, or floods through the delta, through, and it, it's crystal clear and it's full of life. So we suggested this story, and, and uh, we got the green light, and we called them up, and said thank you, and they said, "Are you crazy? We were just fooling around. It's really dangerous." <laughs> <laughs> this is you'll Franz be, you, uh, yeah. Franz, you'll be killed, <laughs> killed it. And I said, why? He said, large, uh, large multicellular creatures called Nile crocodiles. <laughs> and despite hippos, and we dove every day, we would uh, never go back to the same place uh, because there would always be a crocodile waiting for us. A large one, too, and uh, not with a clock in its stomach or anything, but. <laughs> and uh, there'd be a hippo, and uh, we, one night we came around a corner, and Jennifer said, we dove at night in the Delta. And being very careful, diving with our friends Andy and Brad, and, and uh, we would drift down these channels, that, and uh, Andy and Jennifer and Brad and I, looking for a little tiny fish called a uh, Zambezi squeaker. It was a kind of really cool catfish that only came out at night. And that was incredibly scary. Um, and uh, there was always, I mean, crocodiles are not like sharks. Crocodiles can come out of the water crawl through your motel and eat you in your bed. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really like diving with dinosaurs. So it's frightening. Okay. Yeah. And how, I mean, closest calls, I mean, is that, that happened in the Okavanga? It was a constant close call. They would always be on the edge of visibility. Their eyes, you'd see them at night and the eyes glow like coals. And if the eyes are like this far apart, they're like, five feet long, but if they're this far apart, they're like 20 feet long. So you, you don't go for the, you know, when the big eyes come at you, then you have to get out of the water. Um, they're always there. We, we spent a lot of time with sharks, and uh, white sharks, and, and uh, we dove with tiger sharks feeding on, a, on the carcass of a dead sperm whale off the barrier reef, and the water was full of oil, and the sharks were very, very hungry. And as the, as the sun began to get lower in the sky, more sharks came and, and uh, began to push us and bump us. We learned one thing, never get between a really hungry tiger shark and what they want to eat. That's very bad. And don't ever dive with a rubber boat. The rubber boat became saturated with oil, and the sharks began to bite the rubber inflatable <laughs> boat, which is not good. And, and so we drove back to the boat as the thing was hissing. Yeah. <laughs> what, so what was, what has been your closest call? I mean. That, that was close. Uh, I, I, <laughs> um, well, does, does, I mean, 77 assignments, I mean, does it, does it ever get old? I mean, are you, yeah. No, no, it, you know, it gets a bit old when you begin the assignment. I mean, that, back to self-doubt is that the hardest thing about an assignment, any assignment, is getting the assignment. And, then and when you get the assignment, when you get the green light from Kathy, from the editor, from Sarah, Susan, go, then all of a sudden you say to yourself, I always say, Jennifer always says, what have we done? <laughs> and it seems like, and it's a very Sisyphusian existence that we live. We, we push this enormous rock up the hill. We get to the top of the hill, the rock rolls down, and the reward for such a thing is another rock <laughs> and another hill. <laughs> Yeah, we use that analogy a lot in climbing as yeah. well. Yeah, <laughs> pushing the rock. Oh, another mountain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. Fifty years underwater. How, how long have you have you you've been diving for fifty years? Fifty years. So, actually, I mean, a little bit longer, but yeah. Arguably, you've seen more of the ocean and more change in the ocean than possibly anybody on the planet. And 
of those changes, you know, right now, what should we be thinking about? What are the things that you are most concerned about for the ocean? Well, to, to give an example, just to, I mean, 50 years to go back for one second, a couple of years ago, and this will happen this year, we were, were in a space of one year, and both, uh, both poles, not all the way, but in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and in the Coral Triangle. So we've seen, so we have a, a long, long, wide view of what's happening in the ocean. And in the 50 years when I began, every dive was a voyage of discovery. Now, every dive is a voyage of documenting a time, especially, especially in, in the coral world, of a time and a place that will vanish or change irrevocably, whether good or bad, we don't know, but gone. Uh, so we're now documentarians. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an incredible concern. I mean, we were discussing it just yes, last night, and how would you describe the oceans? Well, one of the easiest things, phrases to say, is the oceans are the engine of the planet. And uh, right now, the oceans are in hot water, literally hot water. What does hot water mean? It means an ocean with less oxygen, less growth for corals, less growth for everything else in the ocean. And that hot water affects corals. It, it causes them to bleach. The uh, algae leaves the corals, those anthelly algae, which powers coral, leaves the coral and the, turns white. And because the ocean is still hot, the coral doesn't recover. It means huge storms. In the Philippines, where we just were, they're getting larger and larger storms every year that wreck havoc, that whip across the Vizcayas and, and kill hundreds and that sometimes thousands of people. They haven't even, they haven't even totaled the death toll from the, the super hurricane Tainan, which was their super typhoon Tainan, which was a couple of years ago. Um, so we're looking at this immense change. And in the same time, with all this hot water and this all this extra carbon, uh, the oceans are turning acidic, which means that the coral, the little polyp that builds these incredible uh, works of, of uh, uh, physical works in the world that changes the world, can't build its little house. And that changes everything. It's like a Damoclean sword. That said, I think the most important thing that we can think about is that there is still hope. It is a world that is resilient and complex, uh, that we are just, just beginning to understand, and certainly with all of us just beginning to, uh, just beginning to illustrate. And if I can say something, if uh, this gets back to, I guess the, the proudest thing that I feel that I've done in this is long career geographic. And Vince sort of, uh, Vince alluded to it as the proudest thing is to be able to influence uh, other underwater photographers. Two generations and um, my colleagues, Brian and, and, and Paul and Tom, uh, the fact that I've influenced them is, is makes me very, very extraordinarily happy. It's, it's not ego, but it's the idea that we can continue to spread this vision to talk about the ocean to the rest of the world, to open their eyes to our planet, which is water, not land, even though you've stood on the the very top of Everest, you could, if you had an infinite vision, you would look down toward the Bay of Bengal, which is not very far away, and realize that everything is so totally connected, and the oceans power everything. Yeah. Well, you've done an incredible job of, of that, carrying on the legacy. I, whenever I talk to Paul or when I talk to Brian, um, the influence has been tremendous. I mean, Brian apprenticed under you. Right? He did. Yeah. And he was very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty good. No, he was very good. <laughs> I mean, what do you, 
Let's talk about the future then. I mean, are there, who are the photographers these days that are, you know, that are inspiring to you, that you appreciate, that you look at as well, a well, well, clearly my colleagues here, and then Laurent Ballestas and from France, who's doing some incredible work, and Maddie Smith out of Australia, who's, who's redefining, trying to shoot these, these pictures that I particularly love that are half and half out of the water. Right. Uh, the picture connects the, these pictures connect the, uh, the surface world, the air world, with the water world. And only, it's only separated by this very thin molecular skin that separates these two parts of our planet. Yeah, well, let's talk about that, because you essentially coined the, the shot, the over-under or the half-and-half. Half. How did you first come up with that idea? Well, one of the things is that... that uh, oh, that's Jennifer. That's Jennifer. Can we talk about that for a Yeah, second? let's talk about that. Okay. <laughs> we're Did you take this one? Yeah. Yes, we're, we're diving in, in Cuba. And Cuba, for us, has a very long history. Uh, we started there 20 years ago with an incredible man named Noel Lopez. And in fact, we don't make the pictures. The photographers aren't the heroes of this. Our heroes are our guides and our assistants and in and, and the, you know, the, uh, the air world, I guess you'd call them the fixtures. Those are the people who are responsible for those images. So we're diving with Noel and we're diving with these crocodiles and, and the Cuban, uh, it's, called, it's an American crocodile, that's its species. They're, uh, they're crocodiles, but they're not particularly aggressive. Uh, like alligators, they're not aggressive. The Cuban crocodile, which is a freshwater crocodile, is plenty aggressive. And of course, the Nile crocodile, it will bite you so hard it'll eat your whole family. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this crocodile slides over my shoulder. Jennifer's photographing another crocodile on the surface. She doesn't see it. And it looks like, <laughs> step back, honey. <laughs> And she said, what she says is she said to me, if you didn't take that picture, I would have been furious. I would have killed you. <laughs> but the crocodile passed along, and the next picture, you, she, she whirled around and took the picture. Uh -oh. And these guys, are, they're fabulous, these things. Uh, wow. As they, you know, unlike, the, unlike working in, in uh, Okavanga, which we will go back to and shoot the Nile crocodiles. At night, with our friend Leo's lights, they, they drifted underwater. They're, they're, like, they're like armored submarines with turret eyes. And they'll open their mouth, and they'll demonstrate how wonderful their teeth are. And this one actually took a slice at me. And as it did it, uh, there was a little bit of light and a little bit of long exposure, and it made this wonderful, uh, well, let's say Disney-like moment here. <laughs> That's a good one. So. Oh, there's one of those shots. Yeah, and this is, can, can we talk about this for a second? Yeah, second? let's talk about that one. Can we hold for a second? No, just, um, this is a picture that was made that Jennifer and I worked on in, in uh, Guam, in Tuaman Bay. Tuaman Bay is where all the hotels are in Guam. But strangely enough, it's one of the only places in the world when you can walk down from your high-rise hotel, go out on the beach, put on your flippers, and walk backwards onto a brilliant reef supplied by the deep ocean currents and deep, clear water that surrounds Guam. Brilliant, beautiful reef. And this picture was made in 2004. We went back three weeks, four weeks ago, to look at what's happening with Guam. And Guam has had, uh, as according to scientists, the highest incidence of coral bleaching in the last three years. So what's happened with this brilliant reef in 2004? What does it look like now? This is what we're facing. This is the hardest kind of photography underwater in terms of trying to illustrate climate change. It's what I call the smoking fish, They're like the smoking gun. You just can't get these kind of things. And luckily enough, we were in the same place. We had this image, and we went back, and we found this place. And the coral is bleaching. Now, sometimes corals from bleaching will recover. And sometimes the reef will revitalize. 
But as the planet gets warmer and warmer, this becomes more and more difficult. We're trying to uh, go off on a much longer, larger look at corals around the planet, especially across the, the coral triangle, the richest corals in the world, which is our, in the Philippines and Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. This is uh, the ultimate, uh, ultimate end of, of, um, of absolute coral, uh, coral richness, uh, the highest biodiversity. And we wanna see what changes are happening, what hopes there are, what changes are going on. Coral affects a billion people in this part of the world. It's their livelihood. And there's something else too, it's also, a coral reef is the most single most visually diverse place in, in, in our planet. It is absolutely beautiful. And when it goes, we will lose so much of who we are and what we are. So we have a couple minutes left, but yeah. uh, we talked a little bit about hope. I mean, is when you look into the future, what do you, what do you see? I mean, is, it, is, it, is there any hope left? And, and if so, what do you, I think people would love to know, in your opinion, you know, what can people do? There is hope left. Here's hope. This is a, a wonderful place that we, were, that we were sent back for the 125th anniversary edition. Didn't make the edition. Uh, a place called Kimby Bay, which I dreamed of going back to. Shot a picture eight, 18 years ago there that was a cover and I shot another cover a couple days later in the space of four days. We went back and we began to explore this perfect bay in the north coast of New Britain Island in Papua New Guinea. It's underpopulated in terms of, of the Coral Triangle. There's not a lot of people living there, so there is not a great deal of fishing. Uh, and the fishermen don't know some of the secret reefs. Uh, it's surrounded by deep water and volcanoes and uh, uh, seamounts that come all the way to the surface. We looked and we looked and we finally found at the, almost at the end of the assignment, normally all our colleagues go out on assignments and they say, in the last two days I got the spirit bearer, in the last two days the sharks actually came out of the water and leapt and danced for me, you know, and Brian did that, Paul did that. We usually pack, but in the last couple days, uh, we found this place, and as we were shooting, this father and son came over, paddled over an outrigger canoe, mountains and volcanoes and sky, and it's hope there. It's a beautiful, blooming, successful reef without, uh, without being overfished. However, every, th every time you say something, it's always for now, but hope changes in the ocean. So I, I, you know, you can't leave people uh, with a depressing idea that this world is gonna be so overwhelmed by climate change, we will be living in a place that we can't possibly live in. But we are humans and we can change. Uh, well, thank you, David. What do we do? We're gonna take some questions, if yeah. that's all right. Go ahead. And we got some microphones coming down the aisles here. If you raise your hand, look for me, and I'll try to find you um, as we're getting these things in place. David, where's the one place you have not gone that you'd like to go? We wanna go back to the uh, east coast of Greenland, but I'd like to go to Iceland. I'd like to photograph water there. Uh, and I think we'd like to go to a Bulgaria and uh, look at sturgeons and uh, continue working with sturgeons, Jennifer and I, and, and uh, uh, maybe Komodo Island in, in, uh, in Indonesia. And, uh, Oh my gosh, I, I can't even begin to think of the places that uh, I'd like to see. 
We have one over here on the right-hand side. Um, what's the most interesting wreck you've ever shot? Well, well clearly, I think the, the most interesting wreck, obviously, was the Arizona. Uh, you know, war it's, you know, it's, it's a war grave and a war memorial. It's also the most difficult because it's uh, you know, 660 feet long with visibility of six feet. So that becomes more difficult to shoot there. Uh, we dove on the Coolidge, and the Coolidge was a, uh, it was a trans-Pacific passenger liner, beautiful liner that uh, in 1942, full of the 5th Armored Division, or 5th, uh, yeah, 5th Division, uh, hit a mine in the entrance to uh, the harbor in uh, Espiritu Santo. A guy drove, the captain drove the, the ship up on the reef, and the entire division, except for three people, got out. And then the ship sort of slid off the reef, and it's still there. This huge, long, 700-foot-long ocean liner lying sort of off the reef, and, and you wade out to it. You literally dive from the shore. You wade out carrying the cameras, sometimes on little rafts and stuff. You put your mouthpiece in, you put your fins on, you go underwater, and you see this rock. And attached to a rock is a rope, <laughs> a rope. And you go down the rope, and there's the ship. And you start diving on the ship, and it goes down, down, down from the bow, going all the way down to the stern. The, the stern is, is 206 feet deep, so you don't really get there. But there's full of rooms, full of jeeps and, and uh, uh, long, uh, long guns, and, and uh, even Thompson submachine guns. The floor is littered with gas masks. There's one place that's, uh, that the enlisted man's head, where there's about 80 toilets in a row. Uh, there's the boilers, and the ship goes. Go deeper, go deeper. You'll never return. <laughs> and so you, you come up the rope with, with almost zero air left in your tank, and you're over, you're going, pull up the rope, and you rest on the rock there, and you just hope that you have enough air left in your tank as, as, uh, as your computer winds down so you can come back to the surface. That was, that's a wreck, that's an incredible wreck. <laughs> I'm gonna take one right here. Yeah. So, so I was last wondering, in the context of uh, climate change, are w waters that were warm uh, are getting warmer? Are there waters that are cooling? You know, where we might see and, and see some of the effects there in the kind of the opposite direction? I don't know. I don't know the answer to any waters that are cooling. I know everything seems to be getting warmer from the Antarctic to, uh, uh, to the Barrier Reef to, the, uh, to, the, to Indonesia. Uh, but I, I, I don't know that, the answer to that question. I want to thank you guys again, everybody that's been here. Thank you all very, very much. What an honor to work here all these years. It's been a great morning. The We're wrapping up here. Come back at lunch and we got more for you. Thank everybody who spoke today again. What a great morning. Yep. Look forward to seeing you again.